Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming today and for joining us on WebEx, for those of you that are participating that way. Um, we have a great lecture for today. I just wanted to start out with a little bit of logistics. Um, so to let everyone know, this is part of a series of lectures that we're hosting. And I've got the schedule here. Um, no. There's the schedule of um, upcoming lectures. Um, you can see our one in February is going to be on California endemic fishes with Peter Moyle. Then we're going to have, in March, yellow star thistles. Um, we have several that are um, we're scheduling right now. The speakers have agreed to, to speak, but we're looking at what dates are going to work for them. So those will be on Alameda whip snake and San Francisco garter snake. Mountain yellow-legged frog, California tiger salamander, and one that's not on the list is Swainson's hawks. So we're just looking at dates for those ones. Um, we've got videos of the presentations that have happened already, and we're making recordings of the ones that are, are happening or yet to happen. Those are available right now on our intranet for the um, CDFW employees. And I've got the website there. We are planning on posting them on the internet soon so that we can have them available for everyone. Um, we don't have a video for California tiger salamander. That's the only one that didn't turn out, but we are going to have a repeat of that lecture. Um, and then also, we uh, OTD is giving credit for CDFW employees for attending these lectures. So if you're here in person, Please make sure that you sign in in the back of the room and you'll get credit. If you're attending through WebEx, please sign in with your full name, your first and last name, and you'll get credit that way. If you are attending in one of the offices that's using one connection for several people, just make sure that you send me a list of the people that attended, and you can just send that to me through an email. Um, that's my email address, and you can also email me if you have any questions about the lecture series. So today, we're really pleased to have Dr. Dr. Lowell Diller, who's going to be giving a presentation on um, northern spotted owls and also barred owls and their interaction together. Dr. Diller is currently the senior biologist at Green Diamond uh, Resource Company. He's also an adjunct professor with the Department of Wildlife at Humboldt State University. He received, he received his BS and MS at Oregon State University and his PhD in zoology from the University of Idaho. He was an associate professor of biology at Frostburg State University in Maryland before taking his current position um, on the West Coast. And he's worked for the last 23 years conducting research and monitoring that's been focused on the development and implementation of habitat conservation plans on private timberlands. Um, the initial HCP was for spotted owls, and it was followed by an aquatic HCP, which covered salmonids, um, four salmonids, and two headwater amphibian species. He's currently working on a new HCP for spotted owls that will also cover fishes and trevals. So thank you very much for being here. Right, thank you, Margaret. Um, now, she called and asked me if I wanted to do this. I said, well, it's Spotted owls are like my only, only my favorite subject in the world, so um, naturally, yes, I, I would have to accept this. And but I also told her that anymore you can't talk about spotted owls with all, without talking about barred owls. So I said I actually need to do uh, essentially two lectures, and um, so she agreed. So um, I'm I'm going to try to get through these reasonably quickly. But but uh, in my opinion, this is important enough subject. There's enough going on now that. To, to do justice to the topic, we need to talk about uh, both of these species. So I'm going to start off with covering some of the basic um, ecology and uh, biology of, of um, spotted owls. And, and one of the things I wanted to mention before I get started is that, um, you know, over the years there's been a lot of debate. People ask me, do spotted owls need old growth or don't they, you know, or can they be on managed land? And, uh, so much of it has to do with where you study the animal. So like the, the, the Hindu uh, parable about the, the, the six blind men trying to see an elephant and they touch it and of course they come away with a very different impression. Um, and to a certain extent, spotted owls are similar to that. Again, depending where you study them, you're gonna have a very different perception 
about their habitat needs and 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 their adaptability to manage landscapes. So, as you as you heard, my my background is working on the coast and and which is one of the kind of somewhat unique areas for spotted owls. Um, and so, I, I do have that bias, but I'm going to, I'm trying to give this a flavor of the of the. Uh, to a certain extent, as much as I can anyway, a flavor of the species throughout its range. So um, starting with a little bit about their life history and, and behavior, um, these are a long live birds. The, the, the longest we've documented is a bird that lived 21 years. That's in the wild, in, in captivity, they presumably could live much longer. They have both high sight and paraphernalia, um, which means they, they, they stay generally in the same area for years, and they're supposedly mate for life, but just like humans mate for life, there's a certain degree of divorce. So um, they don't always stay together, but, but they oftentimes stay together for long periods of time. And they're, if you've heard the term, they're, a, they're definitely a case-selected species, which means they have, they have um, high adult survival, but relatively low fecundity. So they're, they're a species, they don't produce a lot of young, but they tend to live a long time and have many opportunities to breed throughout their life. Okay, to maintain these pair bonds, they do a, a variety of things. There's vocalizations that they do. Um, one, of the, one of my favorites you don't get to see very often is allopreening, which means other preening. So they preen themselves, but the allopreening, when they do that, they preen the feathers right around their bill, the things that they can't preen themselves. So when two birds do it, they look like they're kissing because their their bills are together and they're working the the, um, the feathers around each other's um, a sp a bill and eyes. And the interesting thing is, then when you capture them, you can you can stimulate the same thing, and they will literally fall in love with you. They'll go to sleep in your hands by by you doing this alloprinting. So they're amazing bird. Um, and again, most of the the courtship stuff you do that you see um, the courtship feeding and stuff tends to occur with the breeding season, but you can see it just about any time of the year. Um, this is a bird that you don't see flying above the canopy. It's not like a red-tailed hawk soaring about. You don't see it generally flying out in the open. This is a forest bird. It lives in the forest. It's adapted for, for living within the canopy, and basically it's a perch and dive predator. It flies about from perch to perch, listening for its prey, and then when it sees something, it's going to locate it primarily by sound, but of course also vision, and then it's going to pounce on that prey item. And um, their flight phase, you probably know this about owls, owls have special adaptations. If you look at the leading edge of their primaries, it, it, uh, it looks kind of comb-like, a serrated edge, which, which is, I don't know the actual aerodynamics of that, but, but that along with the fact that the feathers are kind of velvety looking in, in, their, in their surface, yeah, and the slotting of their wings is all about uh, silent flight. So these things are absolutely phenomenal. They can fly overhead and you don't hear a thing. They're, they're, they're uh, uh, virtually no noise at all unless they bank or something like that and then they create some turbulence. And they have very low wing loading, which means they have relatively large wings for their weight, which means they're, they can, um, they can, uh, they're very uh, agile. And so, in general, when you see one of these things fly, they're not very fast, but they're absolutely amazing at their agility in flight. And you don't very often get to see it because they're just, you see them up in a tree and you're doing what you call mousing, which I'll talk more about later on. But occasionally you get an opportunity to see one of these birds um, when it's performing at its peak. And they're absolutely amazing at their ability to fly through a dense forest, dodging trees and branches. Um, without you know without crashing into them, so um, that's the real uh, forte is is flying through a for de relatively dense forest, which a bigger owl that might otherwise harm them can't um, can't do it at least at not at the same agility that they can. So the reproduction, the nesting, um, owls, and there's probably always an exception, but in general, owls do not build nests. They use some existing structure that they modify. And so, in general, what they find is some kind of depression. In many cases, it's in a structural uh, deformity in a tree. And you can see there on the right, lower right, uh, a picture actually inside a nest, and you see one egg there. And they simply create a little bit of a depression, and that's where they, they lay their egg. And um, 
in terms of how they select it, I've only seen this twice, but as, as, from the two examples I've seen, the male finds potential sites, he calls the female over, she checks it out, she doesn't like it, rejects it, he goes and looks for another site. Um, but it's kind of like, you know, humans hunting for a house, you know, what do you think of this, honey? No, it doesn't cut it. Uh, at some point, they select it. I, again, I've only seen it twice, so I don't know that it always works that way, but the time I saw it, the, the male was doing the house hunting, the female was, was saying no. Um, so the nesting cr chronology, and there's going to be differences, of course, as you imagine, if you're on the coast where it's a mild climate versus high elevation, but generally it's somewhere in, in late March to early April. On the coast, we've had nesting initiated as early as the middle of March, but in, in most areas it's late March to early April. They're going to be hatching roughly 28 days later, so about a month later they're going to be hatching. Then they're going to be fledging around June, and by fledging that means they simply they're no longer in the nest. I'll say a little bit more about that. And then the, the fledglings usually disperse, leave that natal area, and leave the, the parental care sometime in September. And this fledging, normally when we think of fledging, if you think about a hawk fledging, a red tail or an eagle something, they fledge, they fly away, and they're, they're, they still may be getting fed to a certain extent, but they're pretty independent. In contrast, these owls, these spotted owls, when they fledge, they're oftentimes still little fluff balls. They can barely fly or not fly at all, but they're out of the nest, so technically they are fledged, but they're, they're very much de still dependent on the parent at that stage. So they're poorly flighted, typically, and they need the parents to feed them, they do a begging call, and the, and the parents will feed them. And then the parents, of course, are hanging around there to protect them. If a raven or something else should come through that might attack them, they would be there to potentially defend themselves. Um, so because they fledge early, that means that, that sometimes they end up in the ground, and there's a, a little fledgling sitting on the ground. And the interesting thing, when I found that, the first time I found it, I thought, oh, this bird is doomed because it can't fly. What's it going to do? I sat back and watched, and, and this bird was kind of like a parrot. It got to a tree, and then using its bill and its feet, it, it would hook with its bill and get purchased and with its feet, and it would just slowly climb up the side of a tree with its bill and its feet and get up on a branch. So they can't fly, but they can climb a tree and get back up on a perch. Uh, but obviously, that. At that stage, they would be quite vulnerable if a predator should come along. So you don't want them to end up on the ground, but um, ending up on the ground is not, not necessarily fatal for them. The vicinity I mentioned is, is quite low. They generally um, only nest every other year, and they, they generally lay one or two eggs, rarely three. Um, and it, that varies if, if there's lots of prey and they're doing really well that year. You might have quite a few with, with triples. But in, in most years, um, uh, one or two is, is it. I'm going to try advancing with that. Yeah, that's a little better. Uh, now I want to talk about, I guess, one of my favorite parts and, and why, if you work with spotted owls, you, you can't help but um, falling in love with these birds because they're, they're very unique in terms of the way they interact with people. Um, we do lots of educational tours. Here's one you see. Um, you, have, you can see that, that one owl looks like it's sitting on, on Cat Coleman's head. It's actually just flying through there. But um, what often happens, and if, by the way, if you haven't seen this, it's an open invitation to anyone, come up and I'll take you out and show you an owl, and it'll be one of your top experiences ever. If, if you like birds, this is going to be one of your best experiences ever. In fact, I've taken out birding groups, and I don't think I've ever taken out a birding group that someone didn't have tears in their eyes. They were so moved by this, that, this experience. So anyway, they're amazing birds, but uh, some people react negatively when they, when they go out there. They say, well, you've been taming these birds. They act like a tame bird. And, and, and they do get tamed, but it's not, it's not uh, our intent to do that. And this is one of my favorite stories because I actually had a camera to, to document this about how quickly they habituate. This was back in 1990 <clears throat> when I was first studying spotted owls. So this was a, a naive bird in the sense naive to humans, had, had never been moused before. And by the way, mousing is what we do in part of our, our studying them where we put out a mouse so that, for example, the male can take the mouse, fly back to the nest, and we can find the nest. 
and um, it's, it's really handy that they will do that. So I, I was at this site. I, I moused the male, and he flew up into a large tree and disappeared, and I couldn't see where he had gone. And so I gave him a second one. Same thing happened. A third one, I, I gave it to him. And I was standing on this log, and I was just dropping the mice um, close to my feet, and he would fly down and take them there. I still hadn't found the nest. I was very upset because there was a little bit of competition internally. Who could find the most nests? And, um, and, and you, couldn't, you can't say you found it until you actually see them go into that nest. So anyway, I was going to give it a fourth mouse, and I was looking on it. He wasn't there. He was gone. I thought, oh, man, he finally got tired of this game, and he left. And I went to pick up my pack, and there he sat at my feet, that picture you see there. And I just happened to have a camera. He had flown in and landed at my feet waiting for the next mouse. And this is a bird, the first interaction with a human like that. He's already that tame and, uh, and, uh, and behaving like a pet. So they, they do this. Now, there's a lot of variation in this behavior. They don't, some of them are a little standoffish, but, but uh, many of them are remarkably tame, become like pets. And it's not our goal. You know, we're supposed to be scientists. We're supposed to be objective here. Not our goal to turn them into pets, but it's almost impossible not to do that. And, and again, it's hard to be objective. And I, I would have to admit, I'm probably not totally objective about spotted owls. I think they're amazing birds. Uh, one of the truly unique birds in, in, this, in, the, in the country, for that matter. Um, and just another one, I got a lot of these, what do I call my war stories that, uh, about these things. I had one owl that, that would fly in when I would get in there, you know, to, to mouse it, to determine again. You, you, want, you mouse them to see, to recite them. You mouse them to determine out they're nesting. You mouse them for a variety of reasons. To go into the site, he would fly up and land so close, he would watch me get my container of mice out. And, I, and I, I just started getting in the habit of just holding it out there and let him select his own mouse. He would reach in. He would look at him for a second, and then he'd reach in and select the one he wanted and fly off. I mean, these, again, this is happening right away. And it's not like you're trying to do this. This is just the way they behave. So they're a truly amazing bird that they interact. And you think about it. You have bird feeders, many of you. When you run out of, out of fruit, food in the bird feeders, you know, the, the, the birds don't realize you're the source of that, and they don't come begging at the door or something. Or the, you know, the bird feeder's empty. These things, these spotted owls uh, almost immediately figure out you're the source of the mouse, and when you run out of the mice, they follow you out of the woods. If they're hungry, they're going to be begging for more. Uh, it's just a truly amazing bird, uh, the way they behave. So I mentioned the, the positive things, these things, and I'm saying this because a lot of people, when they see how, how they fly up, they say, well, they must be really dumb birds, you know, that they're not afraid. But it's just, in my opinion, it's just because they're a nocturnal predator in their evolutionary history, they haven't had negative interactions with humans because if, if you, before you lear we learned to hoot for them, you never see them. They're up, sitting up there in the canopy. They're so cryptic, you never see one. So they probably had very... Uh, you know, historically, from an evolutionary perspective, almost no interactions with humans, so they had no reason to be afraid of us, just like an island bird is, isn't afraid. Um, um, but then once they have an interaction, if it's positive, they become like a pet. If it's negative, they're going to remember that, too. And this one was very interesting. We went into a site. The bird flew up to greet us, and this was the first time into the site, and we thought, well, that's weird. How come this bird's flying up like it knows about mousing? And sure enough, it flew right up to us, and we put a mouse out, and it took it. And we thought, this is going to be really easy to band. So we got the banding pole out. When we pulled the banding pole out of the truck, the owl just took off, just went shooting down the hill and was gone. And we thought, well, that is really weird. Anyway, we put the banding pole away, and then we coaxed the owl back, and we got the banding pole out. It fly away. We thought, something strange here. So we, so we ended up having to capture it with a net. When we captured this bird, you can see in the picture there, it had, had, it had been carrying a radio transmitter on its back for 11 years when we caught it. It was on a Forest Service study. That apparently, the radio went dead, left the study area. They couldn't find it. And here, 11 years later, we capture it. And this bird still remembered that un you know, painful capture experience and packing this, this uh, radio around and, and was, af was afraid of that banding pole. So it, it's pretty amazing, and they, they can actually recognize individuals. I, in the early years when I was clumsy at my captures, I did some of them poorly. 
and and the bird when it, any time I'd come into that site, it would come in and would be and would be giving these agitated calls. I'll, I'll tell you what those are like. So you you actually know the state of the bird, and this bird would follow me around, doing these barking calls, indicating that he was unhappy with me, and he remembered me for years, uh, in a negative sense. So anyway, enough about that. These amazing birds. Um, it it's just uh, really unique in terms of the way how quickly they interact with people. Um, well, they, when you would first work with them, they seem so passive and, and they're like your pet, so you think they, that, that they wouldn't hurt anything. Well, one of the big surprises, if you, if you go to climb the nest tree, if you ever work with goshawks, goshawks make all kinds of noise and they, they swoop at you and stuff, but they don't actually hit you that often. If you climb a nest tree for a spotted owl, I guarantee you both members of that pair will be actually coming in and hitting you. And if you have any exposed skin, it's not a good thing. Here's one of our, our biologists that, that wasn't anticipating this, didn't even know that she was close to a nest site and one came down and, and hit her in the face. And I have also been hit directly in the face. Uh, they hit forcefully, but with their talons out, and I had like a puncture right underneath my eye, I mean right above my eye. So, so they're not all passive when it comes to if you get around their nest, they, they are going to try to protect their nest. So, what this, one of the things that this means, because of this behavior and the fact that they're an opportunistic forager, which means they forage at night normally, but if you wake them up in the daytime, most owls, if you wake them up in the daytime, they don't want to do anything. They're just going to sit there. But, but spotted owls have this, this, this innate opportunistic foraging behavior. In the middle of the day, if some critter comes along, they'll take it. So you can wake them up in the middle of the day, put a mouse out there, and they'll say, oh, okay, I'll take a freebie. And, and that means in the daytime we can go in, mount them to determine their status and so forth. And because they're, they're very easily habituated, it's easy to capture them. Relative to other raptors, catching spotted owls is an absolute piece of cake because if they'll mouse, they'll come in, and you see in the picture here, in my one hand I have a lure, a fake mouse with a squeaker in it. The owl's coming down trying to be interested in that, and then I reach up with a snare pole and get it around the neck. And um, you might think that might hurt the owl, but there's been something like over 12,000 spotted owls banded in the Northwest, and, and to this date, I don't think a single adult bird has been harmed by in the capture process. I mean, a few of them have been hurt, but, but none of them actually killed. So, so it's, um, it's, it's not that, I mean, it's not ideal. The bird flops around and it's not very happy in the process. But before you let them go, you do a little allopreening and you talk them back into being buddies with you and you let them go, and then, then you're all good once you've, you've done this, you know, you know, reinforce that you're actually a good guy. Give them a mouse and, and, and then everything's good. So they're relatively easy to capture, um, but our favorite way to capture them is if, if they're one of these good mousers is you get them to mouse off your hand once, then the next time, when they come in, you just simply, you're holding the mouse like this, they come in, you grab their feet when they go to grab the mouse. And it's very low impact, and it's our favorite way to capture them if the bird is uh, willing to mouse. So uh, that's the way we can capture them. And comparison to other raptors where you might spend half a day to catch one bird, if, if, there's, if you have the sites to visit in the early days when we were first banding, you might ban 10 or 12 birds in a day and the only thing that limited how many birds you caught was just the travel time from one site to the other. So they're a truly amazing bird to work with. And, and how we band them then is we put a Fish and Wildlife Service band on one leg, which is a unique mark in case something happens and we can't figure out who they are, we have to capture them again. But for our mark recapture studies, we don't want to actually have to capture them. So we put a color band on the other leg, and I don't know if it shows very well, but you can see that bird is displaying its jewelry and, uh, and these are different colors with different patterns and so forth. And so we can, quote, recapture the bird by simply giving it a mouse. When it goes to eat, it lifts its leg up and it shows, it shows whatever jewelry it might have. And, we can, and then that's a, a recapture, a recite. And <clears throat> like I just mentioned, there's been over 12,000 of them banded in the Northwest. And the thing that I like to brag about now is, um, in, in just a few years back, our study at Green Diamond, we passed everyone up, and we now have the single largest data set. We've banded over 1,800 spotted owls um, since uh, 1990. So that's one of the little things we can brag about. 
Um, their food habits, <clears throat> they're, ta they're, they're basically a small mammal specialist. They're going to be taking mostly uh, either flying squirrels in part of their range, and I'll, and I'll say more about that, yeah, or dusky-footed wood rats. And, uh, and those two are, are very important in terms of which ones they, they take. But in general, they're taking primarily small mammals. That often makes up 80 to 90 percent of their diet. So that's what they're a real specialist in. They also take relatively large prey. Uh, for their size, they have large talons, and, and they also take comparatively large prey. If you think about it, a, spot, a male spotted owl might weigh 550 grams. A wood rat, a large male wood rat, could weigh 400 grams. And, and rats don't just roll over and, and play dead when a predator grabs them. They fight back. And so it's, it's truly remarkable to think that they take it. I always use the analogy, it'd be like if you, every time you were hungry one day, you had to jump onto a German shepherd and wrestle it into submission to eat it. I mean, that, it's, it's a tough thing being a predator. And they frequently have scars on their feet from being bitten by these wood rats. They often end up with lame toes and such. So it, it's a hard life being a predator. It's not easy at all. And these are a really tough bird, too. A lot of people don't think about that because they're so passive and they're so amazing and, you know, they fly right up to you. But they are also a very tough bird. They wouldn't have survived all this time if they weren't. Now, in terms of their nocturnal activity, that, that's a problem with, with, a, with any kind of an owl or anything that's nocturnal is we don't really know very much about what they do at night. When you think about hawks and stuff, people do studies. I had a, a colleague that sat all day long watching peregrine falcons, no, excuse me, prairie falcons, and recording all their activities. And we can do those kind of things, but, but owls, things are at night. We, we have to infer what they're doing primarily from telemetry, doing triangulations. You know they're somewhere out in that area, and you say, well, they're probably foraging, or maybe they're roosting, or maybe they're mating, or who knows what they're doing, but they're out there somewhere doing something. But um, so we don't know that much about them. But in general, we know because we can watch this part that at dusk they generally come off the roost, they preen, they regurgitate a pellet. Um, they'll generally do some hooting to say this this site is occupied, and then then they'll go off foraging. Well, one of the ideas we got back in the 90s was let's learn something. Let's try to actually observe these things at night, learn something about them. So we uh, we got one of our crew. In fact, at one point he was considering doing this for his master's degree, but he couldn't get enough data. But we actually got night vision equipment. We didn't have the, like the latest stuff that you'd have from the military. I think if you had that, we could have really done this right. Um, I think we had second generation night equipment and, and they now have like fifth generation. But anyway, the idea was these had radios on them so that you could generally know where they were. And then you'd go out there with your night vision equipment and try to see them. And you had a infrared light on it. So many times that's all you would see is a couple eyeballs staring back at you this bird um, up in the canopy. So we did follow them around, and one of the things that we found that at the time was kind of surprising is that these owls actually did go out in open areas, not, not you know, in large open areas, but they would out, out, go out, and, and here you see one sitting. Um, it's probably only 50 feet from the edge of a clear cut, but it is out in the open, and presumably they're out there when they're, when they're foraging. And um, these pictures here that, that um, Joel Thompson was one doing this work, he, he didn't have time, if he was going to keep observing this bird and writing down what it was doing and stuff, he couldn't take a picture. So after the fact, that's why none of these have pictures of owls in them, after the fact he would take a picture of what he had seen and then document it, but, but there aren't any pictures of the actual owls. So here was a, an owl that, that was uh, foraging. He had thought sitting on those two different perches. And some birds like to go into the open, but one of the most interesting thing about the birds is that they tended to have very different hunting styles. They didn't do the same thing. And in fact, one bird, that while he was watching this bird, you know, going out there over that study period, all this bird ever did was, was road hunt. And those of you that hunt, you know, you can think of road hunters as kind of a little below the, you know, not, not really the, the ideal hunting style. We think of it as less sporting and such. Well, this particular bird would just fly up and down these old logging roads and wait for some critter to run across the road. and and pounce on it. In fact, this was one of the few actual observations Joel had of them successfully taking prey. He would occasionally see them dive off of a perch, but he wouldn't know for sure if they got anything. But this, on this occasion, he actually saw one take it. It quit advancing here.
Hmm. Did something? Oh, there. Oh, now it. My. Uh, can I back this? This thing seems to have died. Okay. Okay. I'll just use it. All right. We'll switch to that. So here's a, here's a graph that shows some of some of the data um, comparing the visual versus the the uh, radio telemetry, and um, and there's, there's obviously going to be a bias to this because when they're in the timber, they're going to be higher, harder to see. So that was one of the problems with doing this study is that there's a fundamental bias as far as, as where you could see them. But it does indicate that at least part of the time they were using these open areas. The juvenile dispersal, I mentioned that they, they hang around. They're getting fed by their parents throughout the summer. And they get, of course, the, throughout that time, their, their flight is getting, they're getting better and better at their flight. And then along about September in general, presumably the adults quit feeding. And my guess is they're just like teenagers. If you kept feeding them, they would never leave home. But presumably the adults quit feeding them at some point, and then they're forced to disperse. And, um, and so they're going to disperse. And the median throughout the range is about 10 miles for males and 15 and a half miles for females. There's a fundamental bias with all this, though, because um, unless you have a radio on, on all of these birds, you're going to tend to recapture the birds that stay close by, right? But the bird, a bird that happens to disperse 100 miles, the chance of recapturing much less. So, so there's going to be a certain amount of bias. And you can see the data there from Green Diamond. Uh, those averages are somewhat lower. And that's because we're, we're looking for birds within our study area. The ones that leave our study area, uh, we're going to have a very low probability of, of recapturing them. So dispersal distances presumably are much greater than what they would suggest from the from the literature. Well, now I want to talk a little bit about some of the habitat associations, and I want to talk about at different spatial scales. The first, I'll start with the, the nest structure and tree. I mentioned before that in general, what they're going to use is some kind of a, a structural deformity, and and in my opinion, and we don't really have data on this in terms of documenting average fledging success with different types of nests, but it seems like they both uh, select and do well in what I would call a, a roomy cavity, something that has room in there, but it, they're protected from the elements, but they have plenty of, of room to move around. So that seems to be one of the, one of the better types of nests. Another one that is, um, seems to be very commonly used, and another one that I would say that, that they tend to select for is a broken top chimney. I don't know if you can appreciate it in this picture, but there's a climber there in the top of this Douglas fir, this big old growth Douglas fir. He's probably 200 feet in the air. And he's looking down into the top. The top is broken out, rotted away. And so it, it's like a chimney there with a slot in it. And again, the bird can get into this big space. And, and there's lots of room in there. But they're somewhat protected from the elements because wind blowing in, I mean, rain and wind and stuff would tend to not blow in there. So they like to use these. In the redwoods, you occasionally get some of these. And literally, one of them was big enough. You could have raised your own children up there. It was like 15 feet across. And, I mean, that was like the Taj Mahal of nest sites. But um, they seem to, to like those structures. They don't that often, at least in our study here, they don't that often take tight cavities. And in that circle there, that's a spotted owl looking out of a hole. It's coming out of that cavity, a pileated woodpecker hole, which it kind of has to squeeze out of that. They don't seem to use these very often. And, and I'm assuming that it's because uh, fledging success is lower in these because oftentimes what happens is because it's tight, the, they fledge prematurely, they end up on the ground, and if they end up on the ground, obviously that's going to reduce the probability of survival. So tight cavities don't seem to be that, that they're commonly used. Now the other general type of nest is a platform nest, something that either a debris pile or a small a, a mammal or bird built a nest, then they come along and utilize that nest. If you look at the literature, there's a lot of variation from one study area to the next. It's just amazing. Some study areas, the owls use almost no of these open platform nests. Other areas, um, they use quite a few. And I'm, I'm, my presumption is it's probably largely a function of the availability. If there's lots of big structural nests, like big old growth trees and stuff, they're probably not going to use these as much. Uh, in the redwood zone and in where we work, where I've been working, it's about 50-50. Um, and one of the interesting things, we always like to refer to these as a bed and breakfast. 
because they can come along, like in this case, it's a tree bowl nest. Flying school nests the same way. They can come along, they can eat the occupant, and then take over the nest. And that's kind of the, their version of a bed and breakfast. So, uh, um, so they, they can use a variety of these different types of nests. Um, one of the things we did early on, when I first started working in a managed forest, the, the presumption was, well, there, there are not going to be enough nest structures out there on a managed forest. So we actually tested, we made what we thought would be like a perfect nest structure because it's kind of roomy, but it's protected from the elements. And we made a bunch of these and we hauled them up in trees. And, and basically what we learned is they will use them but they don't particularly seem to select for them, and there was no evidence that, that their fledging success was any higher. So we put a bunch of those out back in the early 90s, and some of them are still out there, and some of them are still occasionally getting used, but, but it's not going to be a solution in terms of um, increasing spotted owl populations, at least from what we learned. The, the nest and roost stand, this is one, th um, when I get to landscape level, there's there can be a lot of variation depending where you study, but this is at this level, at the nest level and the nest stand level, it's generally similar no matter where you go throughout the range. And that is that um, even if you're working in a, in a managed forest where there's a lot of young timber, the nest stand itself, the nest grove, is typically going to have a lot of these older, large, decadent trees. It's going to have this multi layered look, uh, fairly high canopy closure. That's very typical for that for that nest grove, the, the area where they're going to roost and nest. And that core area, they don't use the same nest site from year to year. I mean, they, they, they will repeat using the same nest, but they generally don't use the same nest in, and repeat nesting attempts. They, they move around to a variety of, of structures. And that nest core, the area in which encompasses the majority of their roost sites and nest sites um, on our own data, was about 90 acres. Um, the, the Thomas report back in the 1990s, they came up with about 80 acres. So about an 80-acre core is the area in which the, the nests are going to occur. Now I can show you a few pictures here. On these are this is on a managed landscape. Um, we soon learned once we started working there that we could kind of predict where the spotted owls were going to be roosting and nesting. Because if it was a sea of second growth without any residual structure, and then all of a sudden here's a pocket of older stuff, that's where they're going to be, particularly if it's low on the slope, because they often nest um, somewhat lower on the slope. So those, there's an example. You can see the residual structure there associated with that. Here's another example where there's a pocket of residual older trees. They don't necessarily have to be old growth, but they need to be older and decadent, and, and uh, that's generally where they're going to be nesting. So this landscape, and this is where things really get different, and this is where a lot of the debate has been generated over the years about spotted owls. When you get at this scale, you see these two pictures, and, and you could ask biologists, that, spotted owl biologists that work different parts of the range, say, is this good habitat or bad, the, the, the one in the upper right there? Uh, if you're up in Oregon and Washington, you'd say, that's, that's not very good habitat. Look how highly fragmented it is. The, the one in the lower left is clearly much better. That's a sea of of old growth, but it really all depends uh, where you are. So if you're in Oregon and Washington where, where flying squirrels are the primary prey, and you think about it, where do, where do flying squirrels live? Well, they live, live in mature forests. And so the roost sites, the nest sites, and the foraging habitat is all older forest. So obviously the more older forest, the better your habitat. And, and so when, when flying squirrels, and I have one little gimmick here with my flying squirrel flying in. That's the only one I, I did. Um, so if you look at the literature, um, through much of the range where flying squirrels are the primary prey, they need the, generally the more older forest in their home range, the better it, it is. Um, in contrast, though, if wood rats are the primary prey, and you see this, this chart here, this Keith Hom that did his masters there, the redwood zone, you can see that the wood rats are primarily going to be in those younger stands. And so now suddenly everything's flip-flop uh, for the owl because they still need the older stuff for roosting and nesting, but suddenly now their primary prey is in young forest. So now you have a situation where you need young forest to produce your prey, but you need older structure for roosting and nesting. So in, in, in this kind of 
where, where you know, again, where wood rats are the primary prey, it, it changes very much, which also is kind of handy in terms of management. I just happen to be lucky in terms of um, working in an area where spotted owls are quite adaptable to management is, is the bottom line. And so we could develop an HDP that worked for spotted owls. If I would have gotten the same job in Oregon and Washington, it would have been a very different story. Um, so, so anyway, again, back to that earlier question, do spotted owls need old growth or lots of it? Well, again, it all depends where they are. They all need older structure, but whether they, they need large um, contiguous blocks of older structure depends on where you are. Their home range, now this, this is, to me is truly amazing how, how, how different this is. It generally gets larger the further north you, you go, and presumably this is partly an energetics thing that further north um, the, the, the density of things like flying squirrels are lower and probably their energetic demands are higher because it's a colder environment. I'm not sure what it all is, but they tend to have quite large home range further north. But if you look down, one of the interesting things that this shows, and I'm going to try to figure out how to make this mouse work so those, those of you that are watching this video conference can look at some of these. If you look at these two comparisons here between uh, Douglas fir fragment and Douglas fir old growth, you can see that uh, this is, again, where, uh, where the, uh, the flying squirrel is a primary prey, that they tend to have much larger home ranges when it's more fragmented, which means they have to cover more ground to get to, a, to that, that suitable um, foraging habitat. Here's another example in the Klamath area. This, I'd be a little skeptical of, of this number in terms of, I mean, not skeptical that it, it doesn't reflect a trend, but the actual value when you only have three home, uh, three pairs that you're dealing with, as you can imagine, the more pairs you add, the, the larger the home ranges are going to tend to be on average. But, but still, it shows that trend. The smallest home ranges throughout the range are down in the redwood zone in coastal California, and that's primarily because that's where wood rats are abundant in these younger stands. And with that greater amount of prey base, they don't need as large of a home range. Um, so related to that, I wanted to, to bring up a term that maybe you're not familiar with, this idea of habitat fitness. Normally when you talk about fitness, that's an individual thing, an individual uh, survival and fecundity. But, but um, Franklin used this in his, his monograph. He didn't initially coin the term, but basically you could define habitat in terms of the survival and reproduction that it confers on individuals that are occupying that habitat. And he was able to actually estimate um, this this, this um, habitat fitness, so he could he could look at habitat relative to its ability to support a what we we might call a source population, a, a stable or increasing population, versus a declining one. And I wanted to bring up that concept because what he found in this wood rat zone is that habitat heterogeneity, which is a, a term for uh, fragmentation. I thought it thought it was interesting when when you, when you fragment the forest having younger and older stands, and it's a bad thing, it's called ha habitat fragmentation because fragmentation has kind of a, a, you know, a negative connotation. When it's a good thing, we call it habitat heterogeneity. So you've got to know if it's good or bad. If you look at a landscape uh, like the one pictured here, depending where you are, that's either habitat fragmentation or habitat heterogeneity. In this particular case, it's habitat heterogeneity. So this is from the Franklin monograph where he showed in that upper panel the highest fitness, habitat fitness, is when you have roughly equal amounts of older forests and other forests. And the other forests were in, in his area were produced from fires, younger stands from fires, or from timber harvesting primarily. Um, and basically, if you look at the lower panel, you have, you have poor habitat if you don't have enough, enough older forest or if you have too much older forest. And basically what he found is survival is high when you have lots of older forests, but fecundity was low. And, and you'd be kind of like, well, why would fecundity be low? Well, because there isn't very much to eat in, in that forest if you're looking for wood rats, because the wood rats, again, are in the younger stand. So um, just briefly to show you studies that have been done on this to illustrate this, if we start here with this, the Olson study, um, in that particular study, and this is kind of the, the northernmost limit of the dusky-footed wood rat, uh, um, 
she did find an association, a positive relationship with habitat fitness and, and habitat heterogeneity. When you go down to the Duggar study in the Cascades, this is higher elevation such where flying squirrels were the primary prey. She did not find that habitat heterogeneity was good. In fact, in this case, they needed more, the, the highest survival was associated with those which had more older force in the core. The Franklin study I already mentioned where habitat heterogeneity was, was the king. Um, in Hoopa, they have analyzed their data. They haven't published it yet, but I've seen presentations by Peter Carlson. They found the same thing as Alan Franklin, and we patterned our analysis at Green Diamond after Alan's, and we found roughly the same exact thing, which is the best habitat is when you have roughly equal amounts of both, equal amounts of older forest, equal amounts of, of younger forest. Um, one of the other things I, I want to mention, because this is kind of an anomaly in the whole spotted owl world, that throughout the range, the entire range of the northern spotted owl, the highest densities of spotted owls are in California and on the coast. And if you look on that, the, the map on the left there, they, and, and where their density are, that's from the, the, uh, the natural diversity database that Gordon Gould used to um, keep. Is Gordon Gould still around? I'm sure he must be retired, but... He's retired. Yeah, I thought he might. Okay. Oh, cool. Very good. Well, I was actually hoping that maybe Gordon might show up. I haven't seen him for. He was. I was a new guy back in in 1989 when I first started, and and he was the old man. Um, but but anyway, you can see where the really high densities are, and this is partly an artifact. Is this is a lot of this is private timberlands, and surveys are required. So. So those areas are being surveyed more intensively than some of the other areas, but it's still, uh, there's still, it is, it is true that there's very high densities here, and based on anything published in the literature, this is where the highest density of spotted owls would be. And so it often comes, the question is, well, why would we have such high densities of spotted owls in, in that area? And it's partly from what you already heard about the habitat heterogeneity, but the other reason, this is a picture in the Mad River in 1990. And this looks pretty hammered, and, and you'd think, wow, it's going to be a long time before this recovers. But if you know anything about redwoods, they have this coppice growth, so you cut them down and they sprout right back up. They're like a weed. You, you can't get rid of a redwood. And, and so they immediately start growing. You can see that picture there in the lower left inset. That's an old growth tree surrounded by second growth trees that sprouted from the old growth. And then you see the green shoots. Those are the third growth coming off of that. So what happens because of that and the fact that, that it's a very good climate for growth, these pictures taken from the exact same point 14 years later, it's already a jungle out there. Things are growing very rapidly. And in that jungle, in the younger stands there, you're going to have these high densities of wood rat. So it doesn't take very long for stands to recover. That's part of the, the, the reason. Another very important part of the reason is that we have all of these evergreen hardwoods, the madrone, the tan oak, California bay, and they also sprout from the stump. They have coppice growth. So when you go out there and harvest, they sprout right back, and the foresters would, would happily get rid of them if they could, at least in the old days they would have, but you just they're so tenacious you can't get rid of them. And so what that means is, I should have thrown this in here, but if you looked at a picture of a managed forest from Washington, have you ever been up in Washington and seen a managed forest? It looks like corn, uh, like corn or something like that. You know, big big trees all in, in a row, very neat and such. Um, in, in contrast, the forests down here look um, very different in terms of there's a lot of structural diversity. I'm not saying it's that way everywhere, but in many areas, even though it's a managed forest, there's a lot of structural diversity. And so, um, what's the other thing that's important is that a lot of our areas in, in on the coast area were, were harvested under what they called sloppy clear cutting, so they left a lot of residual structure. So that's important that that's there. And in fact, one of the, I'm not going to get into much of the management um, implications here, but one of the things we learned is probably the single most important thing about managed lands and maintaining things like spotted owls and fishers for that matter is maintaining that residual structure. So no matter what civil cultural prescription you use, whether it's even age or uneven age, you need to ensure that that older structure is left on the landscape and that you're recruiting that for the, for the future. That's probably the, the single most important lesson we've learned 
about about these critters is you got to leave that structure on there. If that structure disappears, um, the critters are going to be gone. So this kind of wraps up this, the first half of this, and basically I'm saying, okay, we've got the we've figured out their their habitat. We know what it takes to make really high quality habitat. We can produce habitat lambdas greater than one. So does that mean our our spotted owls are doing well? So that's that's what the question I'm going to leave you with this first part, and then I guess we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to talk about um, the barred owl interaction in this. So um, should I allow for some questions now, or? We'll also okay. have questions at the end. Okay. Does, does someone have a, a question right now? That yes. Oh, okay. Can I stop you for just a second? We're gonna. Uh, Okay. The artificial structures that you put up in the 80s, you said? No, no the 90s? That was early 90s. Early 90s. They looked like little birdhouses. I was wondering if you considered um, making structures that looked like the chimneys or looked like what they would naturally use. Well, we we did. Our idea was to uh, was to somewhat mimic that because a lot of these structural cavities, like one of those earlier pictures I showed, they're uh, you know from a fire scar or something like that. They'll they'll be a, a space that looks somewhat similar to what we had created. So we were trying to mimic that to a certain extent. Um, at the time, it was Pacific Lumber Company. They experimented with some structures, and they they had had similar types of results. So so no, we didn't. When we initially saw that it, it didn't seem to be doing much, we didn't pursue it. But the other thing we learned, the reason why we didn't pursue it, is because we quickly discovered that there actually was enough nesting structures out there. That wasn't, that didn't appear to be what was limiting their their fecundity. So we didn't, they didn't seem to be limited by those. So, so we really didn't need to pursue that. Now, if you were up in Oregon and Washington, where managed forests, like I was saying before, every tree is just a neat little pole and it looks like an overgrown cornfield, and there isn't that kind of structure, then then possibly it would make sense to pursue that and do more of it. Yeah, hi. Um, we learned a few months back uh, about the impacts of marijuana groves and their use of uh, the anticoagulant rodenticides. Have you seen an impact on the marijuana grows and those uses of uh, poisons on the food quality and number? For these owls, um, I'm, I'm going to defer that question because in the next um, half, I'm, I'm going to talk about that. But but the answer is we're, we're we are starting to see some evidence that that, um, that there may be similar impacts for spotted owls. But that'll come up in the next talk uh, or next half. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started again with the second half of the presentation. Um, and just a reminder, people on WebEx, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and type them in, and we'll get them to the speaker. Okay, thank you. Um, so now last time we kind of covered the basic biology and some of the habitat stuff, and now we're going to be talking about the, um, uh, obviously, the, the new challenge for, for dealing with spotted owls. So a little background to that. At the listing, in 1990, the reason why it was listed and at the time, the primary threat was simply habitat loss and fragmentation. This is a picture up in Oregon or Washington somewhere where you can clearly imagine this is where spotted owls are feeding on flying squirrels. You can imagine that kind of a fragmented landscape would not be very good for spotted owls. So um, that was the primary reason for, for um, listing it. And um, you might remember that Bill Clinton came out to Portland and, and and they developed a Northwest Forest Plan that was supposed to solve all these problems. And in the process, they developed, um, uh, set aside a bunch of reserves, um, 18 and a half million acres of reserves. The general thought was that because there'd be kind of a lag effect and spotted owls might continue to grind for a little while, but then they should stabilize because the habitat loss is going to be stabilized. And in fact, that has happened. And in fact, there's been regrowth in areas, so there might you might even say that in, in some areas there's more habitat than there was at the listing. On Green Diamond, I talked about our habitat, and these are you look at these different panels. The red is the the high habitat fitness. This is 
this is habitat that should be supporting an, a, a stable or increasing population of spotted owls. So you would say everything must be rosy for spotted owls. They ought to be doing great. Well, what do we actually know about their trends? The most recent data we have is every five years, they have, we have what we call the northern spotted owl meta-analysis. And throughout the Northwest, it used to be 14. There's now 11 demographic study areas. These are areas where you do mark recapture to estimate survival, like what I was just showing you. And Green Diamond is, of course, one of those demographic study areas. You do mark recapture, and then you also estimate fecundity. You go in and and, and uh, observe the nest and see how many are fledged and all that kind of thing. So you estimate survival and fecundity. We all get together with a bunch of the smartest people in the whole country, you know, analytically that is, a bunch of analysts, and we all put our data through this very sophisticated analysis, and that, that is the meta-analysis. <clears throat> the last one was done after the 2008 field season. It was done in 2009. It wasn't published, you see that reference to Forsman at all in 2011. It took that long, took two years before it came out in publication. And that's, that's one of the real problems with scientific literature. I mean, it's, it's passe by the time it actually comes out. And so when you look at these results, some of these don't look very good. You can see uh, these in Washington show, so they're clearly declining. But what I can tell you is they're way worse than they, they actually look today. By the way, the next meta-analysis is going to be January. It's just a few weeks away. So the 2013 deep field season was the fifth year since the last one. So we're all going to meet in Corvallis again, and we're going to do this next meta-analysis. And I can tell you, I, mean, I can predict that this is going to be a very dismal um, uh, projection of what's happening to spot out. That's my, that's my prediction. So um, I just inserted on there some of the things that I've learned because, uh, as you might imagine, the spotted owl biologist is a, is a fairly tight community. We all know each other. We all get together to meta-analyze, analyze our data, argue with each other, drink beer, and all this kind of stuff. So it's a, it's a pretty tight click. So we, we all kind of know what's going on. And talking to some of the other principal investigators, um, they're telling me some really dismal things. You see the Cleellum, they've had an 83% decline since since the start, um, Dale Herder uh, up at Rainier, he said, I'm afraid they won't let me come because I don't have enough spotted owls left to even estimate survival. So they're, they're virtually zero. Um, the Olympic, uh, in fact, I'll show you from their annual report, the Olympic, which used to have at least 50 plus occupied owl sites back in the 90s, they have now three sites, you look on that graph there, the dark dots, Three, three sites with pairs. They had no nesting last year, and they had eight singles, sites with eight singles. And if, if you look at that graphic, the, the shaded stuff is the high elevation stuff that's non-forest and non-habitat. And the interesting thing now, in, in the 90s, when Scott Gremmel first started working there, spotted isles were down low in the drainage where they're supposed to be. That's, that's where they like to be. They're now all up in the, basically at timberline. The spotted owls that are there are at timberline. And you might guess who's occupying the good habitat. And the interesting thing about it now is if you dropped in from another planet and someone told you to study spotted owls in Olympic National Park, you would say, well, spotted owls like high elevation forests because that's where you find them. But that's not what they like at all. That's where they, they happen to occur now. So, so things in Washington are very dismal. Um, in Oregon, I, I didn't want to take the time to go through all of these, but the one I wanted to point out is the bottom at Tai. At the last meta-analysis, Tai was stable. Their owls were doing great. Well, Janice Reed, the last time I talked to her, they've now lost over 50% of their sites since the last meta-analysis. So things are, are going downhill in a, in a hurry. Um, in California, um, this is the, the trends based on these demographic study areas. There's three of them. The Northwest California, that's what a lot of people know is the Willow Creek study. It looks like things are bumping along, maybe declined a little bit, but fairly, in general, you know, fairly stable. They have something they're, they're actually looking at now. They've lost like 50% of their sites. Um, in Hoopa, Mark Higley said, I can't hardly find a spotted owl anymore. They still have some occupied, technically occupied sites, but they can't hardly uh, find any sites anymore. The Green Diamond, I'll, I'll, I'll say more about that later. Um, so, of course, 
everybody knows now that what the, what the new threat is, and of course it's the barred owl. Uh, one of the interesting things is I wanted to find out a little bit about you know how closely connected are these, and it turns out no one has actually done the genetics of these two species. There is a PhD student who works under Jack Dumbacher at California Academy of Science. His name is Zach Hanna. He's going to he's he's in fact working on this right now, and it's going to be coming out um, shortly. It's going to be a fascinating thesis, I believe, because it, it'll show a lot about the um, the, the bar, both looking at spotted owls and barred owls, and and seeing to what extent is the 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 west coast barred owl different from the east coast barred owl, and so forth. But anyway, um, I had to contact George Bearclaw back in the American Museum of Natural History, and he said based on mitochondrial DNA, they haven't actually worked it out, but he said they're they're at least millions of years, they've been separated for at least millions of years. So that's one thing a lot of people don't appreciate. They think like, well, maybe it's just since the last ice age or something. These two species have been separated for millions of years based on mitochondrial DNA. And in fact, the spotted owl, I assumed it was the closest relative to the barred owl. It's not even the closest relative. The, these, I don't know how you pronounce that. I, I would pronounce it cicaba. Um, um, it, it used to be, the genus used to be cicaba, or, or however that's pronounced. They've since changed it to strix. But these are neotropical owls that occur uh, from Mexico down into South America. That's actually the closest relative to the barred owl. So the spotted owl isn't even its closest relative, which to me was kind of surprising. So what are some of the life history comparisons? Well, they, and this is why I thought they were very, I mean, I assumed they were closer, more closely related than they were, is because they have a lot of these very similar characteristics. They're both strongly territorial. They have these long pair bonds. They have vocalizations that are essential for their, all their behaviors. But the key difference is barred owls are 10 to 25 percent larger. The, the males tend to only be about male spotted owls tend to, or excuse me, male barred owls are about 10 percent larger than male spotted owls. The females spotted owls uh, tend to be somewhat larger. Uh, this you see the averages here. In, in our study area, I collected one female that was 1,250 grams. I mean that's almost like great horned owl size. So, so uh, they can get quite large. Um, the vocalizations, um, I wanted to have everyone get kind of an a opportunity to, uh, um, if you get out in the woods and you hear an owl so you, you can tell these things apart, I was going to uh, give you a few of these vocalizations here. I'm going to start off with the basic location call of a spotted owl. And the key thing to note there, to remember, is called a four-note call. There's no four notes. It's hoot, 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 hoot. That cadence. And in fact, you can imitate it. And in the old days before barred owls were around, anyone could do it, and anyone could call in a spotted owl. Now you have to resort to these things because uh, times are getting tougher. You hear that? And that's a male. It's lower pitch. And so now I'm going to do. Uh, a call, it's going to start off with a male doing a series going into a four note and then a female doing a four note so you can note the difference in pitch. So you can tell the second. There's the male. Now the female. So you hear that it's the same four note, but it's a higher pitch. So that allows us when we're out there, by the way, when an owl flies up, we can't tell what sex it is unless it hoots. Because they are bigger, but the differences are too subtle, we might guess. But when they hoot, if you're any biologist at all, you say, that's a female, that's a male, whatever. So it's pretty straightforward. Now, the barred owls have a uh, their basic location call. By the way, that call is used for, for locating mates announcing that your territory is occupied and all those kinds of, of types of general interactions. The same basic call for the barred owl is, is often called the eight note call because it calls, has eight notes. <laughs> and the mnemonic for that is who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. You get that drawl at the end. And in fact, that drawl is very critical because the length of that draw, I'm going to now do a male. The male have a more clipped note. They don't sound as southern with their with their draw. So here's here's a male, and you notice it's, it's lower pitch, and and it's and it's somewhat clipped at the end. 
Um, I'm going to do another female here. It's a, it has some. <clears throat> Uh, it's a different call. It's a series food, but no matter what the call, they tend to end with not uh, not all the calls, but many of the calls. They tend to end with this draw. <laughs> now, here, here's how that's drawn out. So when you're when you're doing barred owls, it's it's more difficult. If a barred owl hoots by itself, um, sometimes you can say, "I know that's a male" or "I know it's a female," but sometimes you can't be sure, 100% sure. But when you have the two together, the one thing you can always count on, and maybe it's because my ears aren't that good. If I was a concert penis, I could probably tell the pitch. But the pitch is hard to tell, but the drawl at the end, the males are always shorter. Um, it's, it's not as long. The, the females have the longer drawn out. So those are the basic location calls. Now, if for contact, for close-in stuff, when you're, uh, you're talking to your mate, you're talking to your kids, um, interacting with them, the spotted owls do this this contact call. It's just kind of a whistle like that, a low whistle. They can also use this when they're agitated. It's kind of like, honey, I'm here. And if they're 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 upset, they can use the same call, but it's very loud, so it can it can imply different things. So that's the basic location call. It's just that simple. Now there, she's getting up more upset, so she's getting a little stirred up. But when it's low and subtle, that's I'm over here, do you have food for me, whatever, um, that kind of thing. For the barred owl, and this is a call, by the way, if you're ever out in the woods and this happens to you, uh, when, you're, when you're calling for spotted owls and one flies in and it, it's looking for a friend and it lands right over top of your head and it's in the middle of the night and it's dark and, it, you know, as humans, we don't really like being in the dark that much out in the woods. This is their location call. This is their call when they're trying to be friends, find a mate. Um, and I've had that happen right above my head when I didn't know anything was around, and I'm telling you, it's a little unnerving. So you would think that's an agitated call, but that's their, I want to be friends, I, I'm looking for a mate. So that's their contact call. Now, if you're a spotted owl, you, if you're upset, you can do the agitated contact call. That's mostly females do that. They're, they, by the way, do all the begging because the male do all the feeding. I mean, foraging, they feed the females. So males and I'm not saying that this is true in humans, but uh, the males are, are out getting stuff. They don't often beg. Females do a lot of begging and, and doing that contact call. Um, but when they're upset, this is the call. When they're agitated about something, like a barred owl's in their territory. That's, if you hear that call, if you're calling with barred owl call, you hear that, that's a spotted owl, and, and she's upset because there's something wrong. And by the way, that's what this one owl would do to me when I would come back into that site. It would follow me around doing that, round, 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 which meant I don't like you, you know, get out of here. Um, with, the, with the barred owls, when they're upset with an intruder, this is their call. It's a series. It doesn't necessarily sound aggressive, but if you're a barred owl, that means you're upset. Uh, barred owls also fly in, crash into branches very loudly to make themselves sound big, um, and they do that. And then when the pair's there, they get into this duet and cackling call when they're when they're all upset about an intruder. This is the most impressive. <laughs> so uh, anyway, that's. Um, that's some of the basic vocalizations there. There's actually more things that they do, but those are the, the key things. And, and obviously, as, as a biologist, you need those to know those things to interpret who's out there and their state of mind and all kinds of things. You can you can literally tell if a, a barred owl, for example, is a is a resident territorial owl or it's floating through looking for a mate. So there's a lot you can learn from just those vocalizations. Um, I already talked about the reproduction in spotted owls, but just the comparison here, barred owls tend to breed every year, and they, they produce three to four young instead of, of um, generally one to two. So they, they have higher fecundity. And <clears throat> in this one study, I'm going to refer to this quite a bit, this study of Dave Weens did up in the Oregon Coast Range at Veneta, he did an amazing study in that he came in, he put radios on, on 29 spotted owls and he got 28 barred owls, all occupying the same landscape. 
And he did radio telemetry looking at these birds and how they interacted and such. And he also, of course, allowed him, since he had radio collared birds, to estimate the fecundity very precisely because he could find the females. And the interesting thing here, by the way, this fecundity of the spotted owls, this isn't normal fecundity. This is fecundity when you're living in a landscape with barred owls. You can see that over three years at 15 occupied territories, they only had 13 fledglings. So you, you think about what, what that means in terms of fecundity. But one of, to me, one of the most um, interesting um, bits of data is that if a spotted owl pair was with, with, within 1.5 kilometers of a barred owl site, none of them successfully fledged. And the reason they failed, he can't, he can't prove why they failed because he's doing radio telemetry. He's not seeing the interactions. But one of the things he, he documented is that the, male, the female barred owl sitting on the nest, the male barred owl, he would, they would, he would document that it would fly right over to the, to the spotted owl territory. He didn't know what it was doing there, but right to the territory center and either trying to steal food from it or harassing them or whatever. Um, but, but clearly it made a big difference. In comparison, look what the barred owls did in that same time frame. This is 20 occupied sites, but they had 80 fledglings versus 13. So that's with them on the same landscape. So in other words, what's important about this is you're not comparing one study to another. This is on the same exact landscape. They have the same exact resources. Barred owls could produce 80 young. Um, spotted owls could produce 13. The food habits, we already talked about those for the spotted owl. Um, what's interesting about the barred owls, and, and what potentially means that there could be some resource competition going on here, they also, their number one prey item was also flying squirrels, but they took, but it was instead of, instead of being 70, 80 percent of their diet, it was only like about 20 percent of their diet, but it was still the single largest um, in terms of biomass of the things they took, but they took a whole host of other things. And what's absolutely amazing is the things that they're taking, snails and millipedes. I didn't think anything could eat a millipede. They're taking crayfish and, and uh, salamanders, and it's just remarkable all the stuff that they can take. Fish, uh, you actually have pictures of them wading around in streams, um, digging up snails and taking fish. It's just, it's just absolutely amazing. And one of the, the pictures, these are all David Ween's pictures, that shows how they can take advantage of, an, of a, basically a naive resource. As in his telemetry, he noted this: this one barred owl kept flying to the same perch right at dusk, and he wondered, you know, what is this barred owl doing there? Well, it happens to be in these coastal streams in Oregon. They have a lot of crayfish, and during the day, the crayfish stay under rocks out of sight because there's there's predators out there, right? But they're not adapted for a nocturnal avian predator. So when it gets dusk, they come out, and they think they're free, good to go, and they start scurrying about in the shallows. And he went to this roost, and here this roost was lined with hundreds of evidence of hundreds of crayfish that it had taken. And they're not even using the claws, they're just eating the body of these things. But you think about it, I'm, we're talking about the impact of uh, barred owls on spotted owls, but think about some of the other species out there that aren't adapted for a nocturnal predator that can, can take advantage of that. So the thing that's amazing about barred owls is that if there's a, an available resource, it can be just about any kind of, a, of an animal, they, they will take advantage of it. So what does that mean in terms of their, their, um, their home range? And you can see that um, in this slide, and I'm going to try to point this out here, you can, you can see that it was spotted owls during the breeding season, they stay pretty close to home, just like the barred owls do. The non-breeding season, they, they move around, cover a lot of ground. But look at these barred owls. They're never getting much more than a kilometer from home year-round. And presumably the difference is because they're taking such a diverse uh, variety of prey that if they run out of flying squirrels, no problem. I'll go eat, eat some earthworms for a while, or I'll eat some slugs or snails or whatever the case might be. So they can, they can occur at much higher densities. Um, one, of the, um, one of the other things that he showed here is that if you have a barred owl in your territory or near one, if you're a spotted owl, that means you're going to have a much larger territory. So you, you can see that, that, um, that, that line there, that uh, regression line showing that the higher the probability of having a barred owl nearby meant that comparatively your home range is larger, which is evidence 
that barred owls are displacing the spotted owls, forcing them into larger areas. In fact, um, it was oftentimes forcing them into very marginal habitat, clear-cut areas and such. The barred owls showed no evidence, no significant evidence of that. The habitat comparisons, one of the most common perceptions that I've come across is that barred owls actually prefer or benefit from these fragmented landscapes, and that's one of the reasons why they're, they're doing well. And, and we really didn't have data here in, 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 western, in the western portion of the range before the, the Wien study. But you look at, at these data, and to me this is quite amazing, is you look at this, both species are avoiding the non-forest. Both species are tending to avoid the young. They use mature forest roughly in equal proportions of availability. Both species are showing a, a preference for the, the old growth forest. The only real difference is the hardwood type. And by the way, this hardwood type in Oregon is not tan oaks and stuff like this. It's basically alder. It's, it's, this should really be, in my opinion, labeled riparian because these are the riparian areas where they're finding bugs and snails and salamanders and all that kind of stuff. You can see that, that there was a, a separation there. If you look in terms of daytime roosting, same pattern um, all the way across. Um, the other interesting thing is the presumption was, well, these barred owls you know, are okay with fragmentation. They, they do okay there. You can see that relative to this high contrast edge, which basically means a clear cut, both species, both daytime and night, are avoiding the, the edge and tending to select areas that are further from the edge. So both barred owls and spotted owls are basically doing the same thing. They're using the habitat the same way, except that the barred owls can take advantage of these riparian areas. Um, when you look at survival, the barred owls have higher survival, but it's similar in that, that the propor proportion of old forest in their, in their home range influences their survival. So, so both species have the same trend, it's just for the spotted owls that drops off more so that when spotted owls are out in, in a, an area where they don't have a lot of old forest, their survival drops way off. Look at where some of those survivals are down at, at under 0.7. <clears throat> Excuse me, the barred owls have a similar trend, um, but to me the important thing, it shows that both species are selecting for and need the old forest for high survival. So what are some of the key comparisons? So basically, they're both using, despite a lot of the, you know, the, the rumors, the contrary, they're both using old forests. They're selecting for old forests. And by the way, we've seen that pattern in terms of their colonization. Like in our part of the world on the Redwood Coast, the first place we had barred owls was in Redwood National Park. And Redwood National Park now is totally full of barred owls. Spotted owls are gone. So they, they everywhere they have colonized, they have taken that what you might call the ideal habitat, they fill that up first. But generally, they are found on flatter slopes, more mesic locations, because they take a lot of these aquatic species. They have somewhat higher overall habitat flexibility, but again, they're still, they still need those older forests. But to me, one of the important things to note, and this was a study done by Duggar, that there is no habitat that has been identified to date. Now, I'm not saying it won't be identified, but to date there's been no habitat that's shown to be exclusive to spotted owls. In other words, spotted owls can use it, barred owls can't. If we had such a thing, that could be our solution because we could manage for more of that type of forest. To date, that we don't know of such a thing. Um, the trend in barred owl numbers in general, what you, what you see, and I'm, I'm just showing one example in Oregon, their numbers were low for a long period of time we saw the same thing on the, on the California coast. They were a novelty. They were interesting. Was, hey, there's a barred owl, and you'd everybody run out to go see it because they'd never seen one before. They're a novelty for decades, and all of a sudden something happens, and I don't know if this is a critical mass in terms of their density or what, or being able to find mates or what have you, but then basically their population can explode. When you think about their fecundity and their survival, they, their numbers can explode. Their numbers can double in 10 years. So they, they go along low and then they suddenly, uh, basically, they take off. Um, here's another example of that, and this is in the Dave Weed study area. In the 1990s, there was a study done there and surveys done. At the time, there were 30 pairs of spotted owls on this landscape, and they weren't specifically surveying for barred owls, but, but there were just a few barred owls around. At the end of 
Dave Wien study in 2009, there were 18 spotted owl territories left, 15 of which had pairs. And at that point, there were 82 pairs of, of and that says territories, but these were all paired up. So there were eight on that same landscape. But think about that. Before barred owls were around, there were, the area would support 30 spotted owls. Now it's supporting 82 pairs of barred owls. Think about the density. If, if you both need the same kind of habitat, um, it, it's going to be a tough situation for the spotted owl. So w what are some of the impacts then of barred owls around? One of them that people often mention about is how about, how about hybridization? Well, hybridization does occur. It's most common on the leading edge of the invasion, if you want to think about that. So when, when barred owls are in, in real low numbers, I, I view it as a desperation thing. If you're in real low numbers, and you can't find another mate, another barred owl, well, you might get desperate and you might decide that spotted owl will do. So we do, you do get hybridization, um, and, but once their numbers increase, hybridization is largely gone. So you end up with, a, with fertile um, offspring. The, the F1s are fertile, F2s and so forth. And you see a picture of one there. To identify them, when you look at that, I don't know what you think, but that's kind of a subtle difference there. You can see that it's kind of a blend of the two. But if you just see a barred owl, an owl sitting in a tree, and it's a hybrid, it's oftentimes really hard to tell. But all you got to do is get it to hoot. And if it hoots, it's a dead ringer because it'll try to hoot like a barred owl and it can't get it right, and it tries to hoot like a spotted owl and it can't get it right. And, uh, and I've only seen a couple of these, and the one I saw was desperate for a friend. I mean, I'm, I'm being a bit anthropomorphic here, but it sure seemed like it flew right up to me. And when I'd hoot with you know, play a barred owl hoop for it. He would try to do a barred owl. And then he'd play a spotted owl and he would desperately try to do that. It was really anxious to find a mate. And so I think to a certain extent it's somewhat of a dead end. They're not very fit because they're going to have trouble finding mates. But the other interesting thing I, I can't help and, and I, to me that I, I want to mention, even though uh, I don't really have any data on this, is that um, it's almost always a male spotted owl with a female barred owl which seems kind of bizarre because the male spotted owl is only like 500 and some grams. The female barred owl might be 1,200 grams. So why, why is it always that, you know, that huge disparity? Well, my favorite hypothesis is remember when they're courting, they're, they're one of the primary methods for courting is courtship feeding. It's kind of like taking a date, right? Show that you're a good provider. So when a spotted owl is courting a female, he brings her food. He says, look, I'm a good mate. He gives her food to eat. Well, if, if you're a spotted owl and, and you end up being, um, you know, bonding with a female barred owl, you're going to be bringing her flying squirrels and wood rats. She's going to be going steak every night. That's great, right? But think about if a barred owl, male barred owl, tries to court a female spotted owl, he might bring her a slug or a snail, and she's going to go, no way. So I don't know if that's the reason, but you generally don't see it, and it makes sense to me. It would be hard for a male barred owl to court a female spotted owl if he's, if he's given her the wrong stuff. So anyway, it tends to be that way. It's not a big issue. Um, there is some hybridization occurring, but, but that's not the, the primary issue here. Um, physical attacks, <clears throat> excuse me, this is something that you don't see very often, but a study done by Van Lannan where he went into different territories, spotted owl territories, barred owl territories, he put out a, a very lifelike decoy. It was a stuffed bird. Uh, in one case, it'd be another spotted owl. In another case, it'd be a barred owl. You know, he, he mixed them up, and then he'd play vocalizations. And what he found is that both species, spotted owls, are not passive at all. They would come in and they would literally attack the decoy at times. By attack, I mean hit it, forcefully hit that decoy. If it was a, a barred owl sitting there, so they would they would attack, and of course, so did the barred owls. But the, the problem is, it's kind of like a middleweight going up against a heavyweight. If you're 15 to 20 percent smaller, um, maybe you're, you're tenacious and you're going to fight back and occasionally you'll win, but on average you're going to lose. And we've only observed an actual um, physical encounter one time in our study area, and the female barred owl took on the female spotted owl, which is the way it's going to be because the males are smaller, they're wimpy, they sit back and let the females fight it out because they're the big ones. And the female barred owl came and just slammed into the, to the, the spotted owl, knocked it off the branch. They tumbled into the air and then flew to separate perches. 
they they hooted back and forth. In other words, the female was challenging the, the barred owl. The same thing happened the second time, slammed into it, knocked it off the branch. And after the second encounter, the female spotted owl flew away and, and was gone. And, and, of course, the male was gone, too. So occasionally they actually have those kind of encounters. I don't think it very often kills them. In fact, this case, it didn't kill them because getting ahead of my story, I removed the barred owl and the spotted owls came back. But, but occasionally it probably does kill them. But the primary thing is what it establishes, the pecking order, the, 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 the spotted owls quickly learn to avoid barred owls. They become less vocal. Um, it's very hard to get them to hoot when there's barred owls around. And of course, in many cases, they lose their territory. Um, so a quick summary of the comparisons. Um, they, barred owls have much greater potential to increase. Because of their diverse prey, they can, they can exist in much higher densities. Uh, they select the same habitat, and this is probably the worst part of this whole thing, is that in general, the barred owls are taking the exact same habitat. And they're both highly territorial. In other words, they cannot tolerate, they will not, a barred owl will not tolerate a spotted owl near its territory and vice versa. So they can't get along. And when you see this kind of a, of a, of a conflict here, basically my conclusion would be um, the ultimate outcome is uh, if nothing is done, there's not going to be any spotted owls. Um, so maybe I'm getting ahead of myself here, um, saying that, you know, the mention is precipitous decline, particularly where barred owls are most abundant. Uh, strong evidence that it's, that it's largely interference competition, but it might be resource competition as well, because the barred owls, think about that, that the difference in the densities. If you have five times as many um, barred owls in an area, and they're also eating flying squirrels, what's going to be left for the spotted owls? So, so it could be some of both. Uh, well, what can and should be done about it? Um, um, one of the things I'm just going to back up before I get into that is it often comes up, in fact, any time I've spoke to a group where there was a question and answer, that invariably people want to know how did they get here, because it really matters to them how they got here and, and whether or not it's human caused. There's two basic hypotheses. One is that it was a boreal forest route, and that, as you can see from this current distribution, that possibly they went up on this northern route and got to the northwest. And this could possibly have been a natural expan range expansion mediated by global climate change. Um, I have a hard time believing that. If they've been separated for several million years, it's a little, it's a little hard to believe that they just happened to, to be able to cross the Great Plains at the same time that European settlers were, were uh, altering the Great Plains. But anyway, the, the other hypothesis is the stepping stone hypothesis, where the European settlement of the Great Plains, we, we stopped the, the Native Americans from burning the prairies, um, we shot most of the bison, we, we killed most of the elk out in the prairie, and all of which allowed riparian forests to develop. And we also planted trees everywhere we went. We created parks. So we had little, little islands of forest everywhere. And so the basic hypothesis is that it provided stepping stones that allowed barred owls to move from one little spot to the next. And if you look at, at these data, these collections, and um, I'll show you what I'm looking at, the, the support for this is some of the very earliest collections. These are along the Missouri River in Montana back in, in 1873. You can see some similar um, pretty old recordings up in here, which makes me think that possibly, instead of it was one or the other hypothesis, probably both were happening. My guess is they're crossing the Great Plains Stepping Stone as well as going to the north. But to me, one of the other interesting things is, look, there was, there was evidence of them in California all the way back in 1976, but the, the actual expansion of those didn't really occur until the 1990s. So they were here quite a while. And then something happened in terms of them going through a population bottleneck or whatever, or introgression with some spotted owl genes, but something allowed them to adapt. And in my opinion, and, and this Zach Hand, his PhD thesis is going to help answer this, I think we basically, what happened is the barred owl of the east went to the west, some things happened, um, got a few spotted owl genes incorporated in, in this genome, and became a, quote, super owl. And, and they're just an absolutely amazing bird. They're just so amazingly well adapted. It, it's just um, remarkable. So, um, so anyway, whatever the, whatever the reason, 
um, or however they got across, in my opinion, it was human mediated one way or the other, or maybe multiple ways. So, but anyway, regardless of how they got here, um, that it, it, it's still, the, for, under the Endangered Species Act, the Fish and Wildlife Service needs to address this threat. And, and so th they, are, they are an invasive species in the sense that, that they're moving in and displacing a native threatened species. And so there's several federal actions. The recovery plan addressed the need to do removal experiment and indicated that this was a, a very important threat um, to, to figure out how best to do it. There was a scientific panel put together in 2007, and they were the ones that recommended what you really need to do is a removal experiment where you, it's a basic, the study design is you have a study area where you have pretreatment data, in other words, before you remove barred owls, and then half your study area, you leave barred owls alone, the other half you remove them, and you see how the, the spotted owls respond to, to removing that, that threat. So that was, in fact, what was proposed. Um, and I don't know how many have seen this, the EIS on the, doing this federal removal experiment. And the uh, record of decision came out in September of 2013 this year. And they're, they're basically proposing four study areas, one in Washington, two in Oregon, and the one in California where Hoopa is going to be the treatment area. They're going to remove barred owls in Hoopa. And, and uh, the Willow Creek area, which is adjacent to it, is going to be the control. And in fact, once this was the, the record of decision was uh, signed, they contacted me since I've been, I'll talk about this in a second, been doing some removal. And they came down in kind of a show me trip to learn a little bit about some of the logistics of doing this removal. And in fact, there's, there's David Weens, uh, who's going to be one of the principal investigators in, for the Oregon studies. That is a, a quiet gun that my brother invented back in Minnesota for, for removing geese from these uh, urban areas, suburban areas. And, um, and I've actually worked, I used it some, and it's great if you're, if you're adjacent to other landowners where gunshots in the middle of the night are not going to be appreciated, this, this is a way to do the work where you, know, you don't have to serve it. And it would also be useful in, around parks or somewhere like that where people wouldn't want to hear gunshots. Um, <clears throat> and so... The, the work has already started there, and in fact, there's Mark Higley from Hoopa. He's already started removing barred owls. I think he, last time I talked to him, he's over 20 already. <clears throat> but the Oregon studies and Washington study are going to have to wait because they have to do all their surveys first. The first removals in Oregon and Washington are not going to be scheduled until next fall. So how do you remove them? Well, obviously, you, you've already seen from what you're looking at that, that lethal root removal is a key thing. But just, just kind of back up to why that's true. If you wanted to capture them, the, the techniques for capturing them is basically you put up a decoy. You play calls just like you heard here. A barred owl comes in, attacks the decoy because they think it's an intruder. And you have a Dugaza net up there, and they fly into the net, and they get caught. Well, you can catch females pretty readily because females do all the fighting. The males sit back and let the female do because, you know, they're the lightweight. So you can catch females, but you often can't catch the males. Um, and so it, it, it's difficult to do. My experience, I haven't done that much of it, but I spent roughly about 40 hours for every, for every bird I caught. Um, and I was working with a team, and so there was actually 40 hours for, like, two people, a minimum of two people to do this. So it's a huge expenditure, and then you can't get them both. And if they're territorial, as long as you leave one member of the territory, they're going to still defend the territory. So for a removal experiment, if you don't get both, you've accomplished nothing. So you've got to get them both. Uh, and, and then the other big thing is, what do you do with these if you were to capture them uh, and live? The, the Fish and Wildlife, as part of their EIS, they contacted all the states back east to say, do you want any barred out? They got, they got seven... They got, uh, you know, seven requests for seven outs, and that's all that anyone wanted. So, I mean, clearly, I mean, you don't want to start something like, you know, the, the, with the horses where you have huge holding pens with barred owls. That, 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 to me, that isn't any more humane than the alternative. So, in contrast, lethal removal, the bird is very vulnerable in the sense that it has an imperative to, to defend its territory. So if it perceives there's a barred owl intruder, it has to fly in to defend it. It's going to fly in to defend it. 
and it's going to fly up in, in, in within shotgun range very readily uh, where it can be readily removed. And, and when I say this, often people get the impression that this is an easy thing to do. This is not easy in the sense that it goes against everything in me to shoot a barred owl. I mean, it just, shooting a raptor was all wrong, and I find it very difficult. Uh, when I first did it, I mean, I had a real hard time doing it because it, it just seemed so wrong. I intellectually thought, we need to do this experiment, but I wanted someone else to do the shooting, and finally I thought, you know, that that's not very uh, genuine of me. If it's the right thing to do, then I have to be able to pull the trigger. And it was really hard to pull the trigger. So it's not an easy thing to do But um, from that standpoint. Um, but uh, it is technically an, an easy thing to do as far as birds come right in. And, and I actually have some data um, here that you can, you can get both members of the pair. So the basic logistics, um, this is when I first started. I actually now have a, a different aim point on the gun. That's something that allows you to have a, a clear picture, sight picture at night to make sure you don't miss or wound the bird. Uh, I actually have a light mounted on the shotgun now. The dog is, every one of these specimens are valuable, so we want to recover all of them, and I'm doing this a lot at night by myself, and they fall in the brush, and so I have my bird dog. He doesn't retrieve them. I don't want him to touch them, but he'll go down and find them and just point them, and then if they're in the brush, I can find them. So that's what the dog's for. Uh, in the daytime, they're pretty wary. This disco owl there, the, the decoy, um, you don't really need that at night. In fact, I don't hardly use it at all anymore. At night, they're much more aggressive. In the daytime, they're, they're much more cautious, so the, so the, the decoy is, is somewhat useful. And, and by the way, some of you probably don't appreciate this, but um, the reason why you use a shotgun is because you want a specimen that's still good as a, as a, um, you know, a scientific specimen, a museum specimen. So a shotgun makes a bunch of little holes in it so that, you know, the, the, uh, the stomach's intact, so you get food habits data. There's, I'll mention there's a whole bunch of things we do with these specimens. They're all going to California Academy of Sciences. And so that, that's what a shotgun's good for, and most people don't appreciate it, but you think about John James Audubon, and almost every picture you see me has a shotgun. Well, why did he have a shotgun? Well, in the early days of ornithology, you had to collect birds, and that's the way you collect them. And to this day, if Jack Dumbacher needs to collect a bird, any bird, he uses a shotgun. So it's, it's the, the tool that's used. So anyway, the, the, how you do this, you put the decoy up there on the recorder, call in the bird to the appropriate distance, and you make the shot. And so all of these specimens, as I mentioned, go to the California Academy of Sciences. Eventually, they might go other places, but the Cal Academy is very anxious to get all these specimens. There's all kinds of supplemental data that's being collected. They're doing oral swabs, cloacal swabs, um, removing blood samples, removing liver samples um, for, for dealing with the rodenticides. And so there's lots of different things that, that these specimens are used for. They ultimately, like I say, all end up in the museum. And in fact, um, that question was asked earlier about the rodenticides. Yeah, using to, to test for rodenticides, you can't use blood. Well, you could, but but unless they had a, a meal with rodenticides in it that same day or something, you wouldn't detect it in the blood. You need liver samples where it's going to be uh, going to get bioaccumulation. And so what we have been doing is using these barred owls, taking liver samples from these barred owls as a surrogate for spotted owls. And this is a paper that Murad is going to be publishing, but so far it looks like close to 50% of the barred owls are, are, have been exposed to rodenticides. And think about it, they're eating all kinds of things. And think about what the load is likely to be in spotted owls since they're basically eating nothing but small mammals, so it's likely to be much higher. In fact, they've only, only had two spotted owls to test. These were road kills, and both of those um, had significant um, uh, rodenticide um, contamination. So this is yet another threat <laughs> that we have to deal with um, that's likely to be important to spotted owls. So I, I want to finish by talking a little bit about um, before this EIS was done, um, at Green Diamond we were able to do a pilot study. And the reason why we didn't have to do an EIS, it was all on private lands, and we were only going to remove relatively small numbers of barred owls so I was able to get a permit, a scientific collecting permit, to allow 
do this study. In fact, actually, initially it was with Jack Dumbacher, Cal Academy, then I was able to get my own. <clears throat> but the basic study, as you can see there, treatment and control, one, one half you remove barred out, the other half you don't. Um, some of the effort, cost efficiency, in fact, the paper's coming out, it'll be out very soon in, in the Wildlife uh, Society Bulletin, is looking at um, the cost of doing this. And you can see the average cost, two hours and 23 minutes per hour collected, but this also included the fact that we're taking, we're doing all these samples out in the field, we're doing cloacal swabs. And when I get done, I, I would do a bunch of additional surveying to make sure there aren't other barred owls around. Uh, so this was a kind of maximum efficiency. In terms of the shot time, in other words, how long did it take from when you arrive to the site to when you actually lethally remove the bird, with females, the majority of them is like 90% were under 30 minutes. So in other words, they fly in very quickly, very aggressively. It's all over. The males are, are, are a little bit more passive. They're a little bit more work. In terms of efficiency, we got 100% of the territorial barred owls that were out there. The only ones we didn't get were what we call colonizers. You remove a, a pair of barred owls, and let's say a month later, a barred owl shows up at that site. But it's not yet he hasn't really decided that he's going to defend his territory. So you, you detect him at the site, and he's, he's real cautious and such. And you come back the next time, and he's gone. So there were, there were eight of those that we didn't get, but otherwise we were able to get 100% of, of the barred owls. So it's very different than a, a lot of uh, uh, species that are trying to be controlled. Uh, what does that mean for green diamond data? We were going downhill just like everybody else when barred owls started showing up. And you can see there in, in, uh, um, in 19, when we started the removal study, things have bumped up. Now, they haven't gone back up to, to up here where you might call the pre barred out era. But keep in mind, we're only removing them from half of the study area. So half of our study area is still um, going downhill. In fact, I'll show you one of, these, one of these paired areas. You can see where we started doing control. And the interesting thing here is we actually now have more occupied sites than we did prior to the, the barred owl era. Um, in Redwood Creek, they're, they're continuing to be down. And the thing that this doesn't show, this is just occupied sites. What it doesn't show is in Redwood Creek, in the last three or four, I don't know how many years, we've had like one nest in that time. So the spotted owls are still there. They live for 20 years maybe. But they're not nesting anymore because they're surrounded by barred owls. So they're still there. And they show as occupied sites, but we're just picking up singles and floaters and such. But they're, they're not even coming close to replacing themselves. So uh, it, it's actually more dismal than it looked. Um, and, and by the way, we're actually going to be analyzing the data this year as part of this meta-analysis to, to actually look at the impact of this removal on spotted owl survival and fecundity. So um, that. I'm kind of in conclusion here that, that all of this suggests that, that removal experiments are feasible, and if they're done, it's likely to show that there's a major impact of barred owls on, on spotted owls. And ultimately, I think it's, it's you know it's the will of society because this, um, in, in the long term, it's going to be it's going to take quite a commitment to do some kind of range-wide management. So I think it's largely going to be society that decides whether or not we should spend the money and effort. Um, to uh, save the spot out. I mean, I think it's probably obvious where my feelings are on this, um, but but um, ultimately I, I think it will be how society reacts to these initial experiments, whether or not we're going to continue this. So I guess I want to, we don't need to answer these, but some of the questions that have come up a lot I wanted to mention, and one of these is it ethical to kill some individuals of one species to save another. And in fact, if you're interested, I was asked to write a piece for this. I don't know how many are familiar with the um, what's it called, the Wildlife Professional. It's a publication of the of the Wildlife Society. Uh, in this current issue, the winter issue, there's an article in there. They asked me to write my uh, opinion piece on that, and and so I won't go into that. You can read it if you're interested. But um, but there is some some interesting things to consider. Um, one of the other things that often comes up is this a choice of one owl over another, or is it, I think if you're better informed, is, is it a choice to have both owls? Because there's no way we're going to be removing all barred owls. No one intends to do that. But can we keep them at a number, at a, the barred owls at a level, at least in some areas, 
to allow both species to persist? So that's a common question. Uh, another thing that, that, to me, that comes up is if, if our actions have put one species in jeopardy, is it, is it basically ethical to just walk away and say we're not going to do anything to, to save that species? That's kind of the other side of that, that ethical question. Um, one of the things I very commonly hear is let nature take its course. Well, I find that a very hard thing to swallow because our, our Earth has been so modified, there's no such thing as letting nature take its course. If nature is taking its course, um, the, the Great Plains wouldn't have been modified. There very likely wouldn't be barred owls here now because if they were, if, again, if they were separated for two million years, it's very unlikely they would be here today. So if we created that, that, that mess and now we say let nature take its course, I mean, to me that's not a, not a very viable option. Um, but it's something that a lot of people talk about. Um, and one of the other things that always comes up is can't we just protect more habitat? And, and to me, the issue there is if, if there's no habitat exclusive to barred owls, I mean, to spotted owls, if you create more habitat, aren't you going to just end up ultimately with more barred owls? Um, and finally, people often ask, what would the range like barred owl management look like if it was implemented? And I, I am going to answer my opinion what I think that would be. We have critical habitat for spotted owls, and I'm not saying we could do it everywhere, but we could designate some of those critical habitat areas and say, in these areas, we're going to keep barred owl numbers at a low enough level that spotted owls can also coexist there. So we could select those areas. It would be a long-term thing. We may have to do it indefinitely, but we could continue to have spotted owls around by doing that. So um, that's my general thoughts, and thank you for your attention for this long-winded spiel, and if there's any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Um, has there been any research done on what the barred owl's impact on other species in there um, has been? like? Tiger um, no, there hasn't. One of the things that's been noted in, in Washington, this is all anecdotal, that, that screech owls have basically disappeared from, from areas that are now have high densities of barred owls. And screech owls apparently are, are a little like little, you know, little terriers or something. They think they're much tougher than they are. And it's actually been documented that they'll come in and confront a barred owl. And of course, the outcome is quite predictable. And so um, in some areas, they have the biologists saying we can't find a screech owl anymore. So, but no one has actually studied that. So there's that impact. But but what they're hoping to do, and and there's going to, it's going to be dependent on funding. Is part of these removal experiments, they want to actually look at some of these other potential cascading effects. So it's very likely that they're going to discover that there's a whole host of species that are being impacted by a high density of this novel uh, avian predator, nocturnal avian predator. Well, has anybody looked at the food habits of the hybrids? Um, I don't think so, because they're pretty rare. I mean, again, in, in Oregon, back in the early 90s, when, when the invasion of Oregon, so to speak, if you want to call it that, was first starting, there were a fair number. Now they can't hardly find any. Um, it's such a small group that, um, that, no, no one has done that. My guess is it's going to be a mixture just like everything else. They're kind of a mixed up species. Some of them probably going to be behaving like spotted owls, excuse me, others might be behaving like barred owls. Um, are there any human activities that would attract barred owls to a site? Human activities? No, probably not, because I didn't, I didn't mention this. I should have mentioned this when I was talking about the behaviors. In general, spotted, excuse me, barred owls are, are quite different. Um, from spotted owls in that they don't, you can't readily mouse them. Occasionally you can, but you have to work at it. And they don't become habituated. When I say they don't, there's always a few exceptions, but like 99% of them don't become habituated. You can't mouse them. They behave like what I would, I would say, like a great horned owl. If you ever tried to approach a great horned owl, they'll let you get reasonable distance and then they fly away, they're gone. And so typically, you know, they're, they're going to fly away. So generally, human activities, they're going to, a, a barred owl is going to fly away from it. 
So things like leaving litter or, or food around wouldn't attract barred owls. No, this is not like the this is not like the raven or corbett issue um, at all. At least in my mind, it, it's there. Again, there the interesting, the amazing thing, at least to me, is based on this Dave Ween study, is is they're behaving very similar in terms of the habitat they need, the fact that they avoid edge, open areas, and all that. Um, it, it's just again that uh, the, the, the real issue here is that the barred owls can utilize that same habitat much more successfully in terms of producing way more young and, and occurring at much higher densities. But things like that don't seem like that's, that's uh, attracting them. In fact, I would think, if anything, they would avoid it probably more than spotted owls because spotted owls, if they get habituated, they actually will, will fly up to people to see if that person might happen to have a mouse. So, um, in fact, that's a problem in, in public lands where you don't want spotted owls flying up to just any hiker on the woods because some people are going to harm an animal just because they can. We don't worry on private lands because we have all of our areas um, are, are gated, so the general public can't get in there. But that's actually a potentially a problem. So I would think spotted owls would be more likely to attract it to, to human activities than, than barred owls would. Um, in the areas like in Washington and Oregon where you say the spotted owls have receded up to the timber lines, are there still populations of non-breeding spotted owls in the lower levels where the barred owls have taken over, or are they kind of completely gone now? Well, actually no one knows the answer to that because when we study owls, spotted owls, barred owls, the only way we can determine if they're there is if they're territorial and they respond to our calls. And, and so, the, <clears throat> excuse me, what we call often call the floater population, they're invisible. They're out there, and every once in a while you happen to see one, but it won't hoot back. So there's no way to really estimate that. But the only thing I could say that might shed some light on this is in British Columbia, they thought spotted owls were almost extinct. And, in fact, they, as what often happens when something's close to extinct, they started a captive breeding program. And, and by the way, that's a little... Thing I'll plug and throw in here that, that it's probably way less expensive to, to keep barred owls at a lower level and, and, and keep spotted owls around than it would be to get to the point where we have to do captive breeding. But anyway, as an aside, in, in, in BC they were doing captive breeding, and, but they also went out and removed barred owls from selected areas. The, the, uh, I don't remember the exact number, like 17 areas, the, the last known areas that were occupied by spotted owls. They didn't know if any spotted owls left in British Columbia. They caught them all, took them into captivity. They removed those, and I don't remember the exact number, and I don't know why this hasn't been published, but, but I know the, 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 the guy that's doing the work. And, and something like seven of those territories, since they removed the barred owls, have been reoccupied by spotted owls, and they didn't even know they had any left. So basically what that tells me, because they're long-lived, the answer, my guess, is yes, they are out there. They live a long time. In fact, they're likely to live even longer if they don't reproduce because reproduction is, is, is hard on an animal. I mean, you think about the males, they're doing all that foraging, feeding, you know, a female and kids and such, puts them at, at tremendous risk, the, the energetic demands of the female. So if they're not breeding, they probably actually live longer because they're, be, they're, they're not going to be putting themselves at much risk. So it wouldn't be surprising, you know, that, that these animals easily hang around for some of them for 20 years. So, for, so very likely, the answer is yes, they're there, but they're under the radar and they're not and they're not reproducing. So ultimately, the outcome is going to be the same. But they're going to persist for a long time. But these removal experiments—that's what's going to be really fascinating about them. the removal experiments that are being proposed will actually demonstrate whether that's true or not. How long will the removal experiments go on before the um, results may be used set for a management plan or recovery strategy? Yeah, that, that's a good question. That, um, they're proposing four years uh, for these removal experiments, and, and uh, that they think will be enough time to document what the response will be. And then presumably they'll have to do another EIS, which will take three or four years if it's like the last one, before they propose any, any long-term management. 
And one of the other things I want to mention about the long-term management is that um, most species that we think of as invasive are our selected species. They have real high fecundity, right, and relatively low survival. And they're really hard to control because you can get, them, get almost all of them and then you, you, you back off a little bit and then, boom, the population explodes again. Well, well, barred owls are just like spotted owls. They're a case-selected species. You looked at that survival, 0.92, very high. But they also have pretty high fecundity, which is, is a little bizarre. But anyway, it's still, the point is, they are a case-selected species, which means if adult mortality increases even a, a little bit, their population is going to, the, in, the relative increase is going to slack off. In fact, it's going to decline. And we did some what I'd call naive simulations where we didn't deal with immigration. And an increase of 10% mortality in barred owls was enough to stop the increase, 20% increase in mortality. In other words, all you have to do is remove 20% of the breeding adults each year, and the population actually starts to decline. So, so that when you get into the management phase then, and um, actually I meant to mention this earlier, it's not like the removal experiment where you want to get an, an experiment, you want a strong signal, right? You want to remove all of them from one area and leave none in the, in the other. I mean, excuse me, all from one area, leave them all alone in the other. So in a removal experiment, we're trying to get them all. In long-term management, you don't need to get them all. You just need to get enough that the population would, would, would drop and then keep it at a lower level. So the long-term management, which would follow, assuming they do it, doesn't involve the same level of effort. It simply means you got to increase adult mortality by maybe 20, 30 percent, and, and the population will decline. But your, the answer to your question is four years. I gave you a long-winded answer to four years. No other questions? Do we have any questions from WebEx? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Very wonderful presentation. Thank you. All right. Thank you.